Okay. Well, um, it looks like it is about seven o'clock here on the North Oregon coast. Um, we have had a beautiful day today. Uh, it was a fun couple days. If you've been watching the weather, we had snow, I think two or three days ago. Um, it was just a dusting uh, down here on the beach. So that was really exciting for April. I heard that it was the first, um, first April snow that was ever recorded at the Portland airport. So um, yeah, interesting couple of days, but today has been absolutely gorgeous. Um, there have been MERS being seen at the Haystack Rock and even puffins are being seen there, which is so exciting. It's been about, I think two weeks or so since the first puffin sighting of 2022. And so I hope you get a chance to come out and see the puffins at some point here in Cannon Beach. Uh, my name is Hannah and I'm a board member with the Friends of Haystack Rock here in Cannon Beach, Oregon. And I'm so excited to welcome you all to our um, library lecture, our April library lecture. We just have one more for the end of this season and then we'll kick it back up in the fall. And uh, just a couple things to remember, this will be recorded on Facebook Live. So if you'd like to go back and review it again, you're welcome to go on our Facebook page, the Friends of Haystack Rock, and it, it will live there. But we'll also be sharing it to our YouTube channel when I um, get my act together and post it there. And so you can share that to anyone that you'd like, the YouTube channel link or the Facebook Live. Um, and also Facebook has this really cool tool where it does, um, uh, it does live closed captioning. So if you would like to check this out uh, with the closed captioning, there should be a link somewhere in the bottom of the screen so you can, you can read what we're saying as well. Um, so go ahead and turn that on if you'd like that. And as usual, what we'll do is uh, ask any questions at the end to our speakers. So if you do have any questions, make sure to go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll review those at the end. Uh, of this talk. And I'm so excited to welcome Hillary and Jesse today um, to join us. And thank you all for tuning in. And Hillary and Jesse, I'm going to turn it over to you all. Great. Well, thank you so very much for having us. Uh, my name is Hillary Burgess, and I am the monitoring coordinator with NOAA's Marine Debris Program. Um, and Jesse and I are just so excited to share about this project with you. I'll let Jesse introduce herself real quick while I'm getting our um, slides up and, and shared. Thanks, Hillary. Um, and thank you, friends of Haystack Rock. Um, it's great to be here. Um, the timing is wonderful because uh, I just returned from a number of trainings. Uh, rolling out NOAA's protocol all along the, the coast. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jesse Jones and I am the coordinator for, the volunteer coordinator for Coastwatch. All right, can folks hear me? Yep, you can hear me and you can see our introductory slide, I hope I always have to check. <laughs> Yes, it's there. Okay, okay awesome. Right, so uh, we'll be talking to you about um, tackling marine debris with citizen science using NOAA's Marine Debris Monitoring and Assessment Project, also known as MDMAP. Jesse and I are gonna sort of tag team here um, and kick it, kick it back and forth a little bit. So uh, I'll, I'll start us off with kind of a background on um, NOAA's Marine Debris Program and how this monitoring effort fits into our overall kind of strategy for, for addressing marine debris um, nationwide. I sit uh, in Seattle, but I support this effort uh, around the country and I get the pleasure of working with local community groups who are active on the ground, passionate about all kinds of conservation um, and, and marine environmental issues, including marine debris like Jesse. Um, and so again, it's just a thrill to be here highlighting the awesome work of Coast Watch. So first of all, the Marine Debris Program, just kind of background on, on who we are and how we work. Uh, we're uh, a, an entity within um, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We're primarily um, 
a grant making organization. So we fund removal and prevention efforts and also do and also do research um, and monitoring. So our overall mission is to investigate and prevent the adverse impacts of marine debris. And we exist because Congress decided that our program needed to exist. Um, and we get mandates from something called the Save Our Seas 2.0 Act, which um, is kind of gives us, tells us kind of the priorities that we need to work on and, and, and monitoring is one of them. And I'll kick it over to Jesse here to orient you to Coast Watch. Thank you. I'm not sure why my video, I think uh, my video may show up. Maybe um, Hannah can help us do that. But um, my name is Jesse, as I said before, and I work for an organization called Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition. Um, Oregon Shores has been around for many, many decades, helping to protect the coast of Oregon and um, keeping the Oregon Beach Bill alive. Um, the program that I coordinate is called Coast Watch, and we are a mile by mile beach adoption program on the Oregon coast from Astoria all the way down to the California border. Um, volunteers adopt a mile, and then many of the volunteers want to get deeper involved. And um, they often will sign up with a citizen or community science program such as NOAA's. And so if you are not yet a Coast Watcher, um, you can contact me. We have many other citizen science programs available, including uh, the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team, um, the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. We have a number of partners, uh, King Oregon King Tides Photo Project, um, and I consider Coast Watch kind of a gateway uh, to citizen science and community science programs available to you on the Oregon coast. Such a cool program. Um, I used to work for, for Coast, the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey team, and got, got the benefit of partnering with Jesse and her colleagues at that time too. And um, just always been so grateful for the way that they're connected to individuals all up and down the coast and help kind of facilitate connections between what people are interested in and activities um, that are impactful. So, Thank you, Hillary. And I'm so glad that we haven't lost you because it was great to work with you at <laughs> Coast and now you're at NOAA. I know, and so I, the West Coast gets, gets a little more attention for me because it's close to my heart and all the partners here are close to yeah. my heart, but... Mm -hmm. um, so kind of back to where we're situated with the NOAA, I mentioned that we have a handful of, so the ways that we uh, as an organization tackle the issue of marine debris are through these different program pillars. And we have um, a, a set of different strategies and sort of approaches to funding uh, the uh, actions on these issues. And um, monitoring and detection was kind of recently elevated as an issue that is meant to inform all these other pillars. So um, with better knowledge about the issue of marine debris on our coastlines, we can make better decisions about how to use resources to prevent and remove and um, deal with emergency response issues like hurricanes and tsunamis, um, and, then, and then work with partners and help them maximize um, their efforts. So, so that's where monitoring really fits in. It's about understanding the state of the issue. And the way that we do that is through MDMAP, which is a shoreline monitoring method um, for documenting marine debris that's two and a half centimeters or greater. So about a bottle cap or larger. So stuff we can see pretty readily with the naked eye. Um, it was established in 2011, uh, really with the goal of providing a really scientifically robust method um, that anyone could use that had access to a shoreline, but that would produce high quality usable data that, that we could really act upon. And the data from these surveys can be combined and compared so that collectively, as well as individually, they can be used to understand the state of marine debris. And so it functions as a network of individuals and organizations like Coast Watch and its volunteers who contribute and use the data. And essentially folks, whoever is interested in participating, chooses a site, they select 
areas we call transects within that site to survey each time. They record conditions about the environment um, as they find it when they're doing a survey. They count and categorize the debris that they find, enter it into a globally accessible database, um, and then repeat so that we can get a signal of what marine debris looks like over time and across geography. That's kind of the whole thing in a nutshell, and we're going to dive into kind of different components of it and how the data have been used um, over uh, the next bit of time. But before that, I'm going to kick it back over to Jesse. Thanks, Hillary. Um, so yes, a big question that volunteers have is why do this? And so that, that's why this is a great opportunity. And I'm seeing some folks here that are uh, either have been um, a marine debris surveyor for a while, or you just joined in the last two weeks, which is great. Um, so I talked a lot about Hillary on the road when I was there meeting all of you. Um, and these are some photos of some of the recent um, site character characterizations. And so the, one of the first steps, and we'll talk about this a little bit later too, um, in, uh, in, in creating a site um, is to create a site and you choose hundred meters. And what you can see here on the left photo and even in the right photo is something called a wheel measure. And these are things that Coast Watch is now providing um, our volunteers that they can not just measure out their site, which that happens one time, but actually measure out those meters when they would like um, these kind of flew off the shelf uh, when I was there on the road. You seem to like them. We also will provide flags. Um, but here we have on the left side um, is the new Battle Rock site down in Port Orford. And then on the right, this is the new Neskowin site. And this is a group of Coast Watchers who have uh, adjacent miles to each other. So I love that. I love this too. These are fabulous photos. And if for anybody that was Part of these trainings, uh, welcome to the MD Map team. Great to have you here. Look, and so back to why we're doing this. What what is what is NOAA? What are NOAA's goals out of, for MD Map, and 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 what are we doing in order to try to reach those goals? So the, the the big kind of scientific question is, how much debris is on our shorelines? What can we say about the sources of that debris? So um, what are the types and the materials and are those changing over time? And there's a whole bunch of different questions within that kind of overarching goal that you can ask, like does a certain policy work for preventing debris? Do certain behaviors work for preventing debris? Um, are upstream changes visible downstream, upstream, you know, upriver, up in urban areas, visible on our shorelines. Um, and all of those kinds of things can be answered um, with enough data using MD map. And so ultimately the, the point here is to both guide and evaluate prevention um, so that we use our resources wisely and uh, reduce this environmental issue. And actions um, that result from collecting the data and the insights that come from collecting the data can happen at any scale by anyone. So I'm going to share some examples of, of that. Um, but examples can include like identifying hotspots of debris, so areas where it really predictably accumulates a lot um, to target those for cleanups, um, to setting local targets for reduction and reaching out to certain kind of communities or folks that engage in certain activities that we're seeing result in a lot of debris um, to even like at the highest level informing policy and regulatory decisions. And then really key here is providing tools and support to partners who want to contribute to this kind of larger picture um, while also helping them meet their own goals. So sometimes there's, you know, different questions that people in, in that we're partnering with um, want to ask of the data and, and we try to work with them to customize uh, things so that so that it's flexible for them to do so. And then um, providing resources for them to access and, and work with the data too. So 
here is kind of the, the grand picture of MD math in the United States since 2012. So you can see um, over, over time, there have been, there's been a lot of data collected and it's resulted in um, some really cool stories and some really cool impacts. Um, and we're, we're hoping um, over the next 10 years to increase those even more um, for greater impact. Uh, but something that I've noticed just in my time with the program, which has only been, it's been less than two years, um, is that uh, it's in, MDMAP is increasingly being adopted internationally. Um, so the more we can use it locally, the more likely we are to be able to draw comparisons across coasts. And we know this is an international issue, um, the borderless issue. And so having data that's comparable, not only on our coast, but to other coasts, I think is really powerful and exciting. Um, and it wouldn't be possible without an incredible array of partners. Um, this is just a smattering that I want to highlight. Um, of course, Oregon Shores and Coast Watch is in here, um, but you may see some other familiar ones um, up and down the West Coast and along the uh, Gulf of Mexico, Alaska, um, Florida, Northeast. Um, it, it's really fun to get to work with these folks. Uh, and also you'll see that there's other other federal and, and regional and local agencies too. So um, again, super fortunate uh, that this variety of folks sees value in the effort and, and um, is interested in contributing and making use of it too. So uh, one way that we support folks in participating is we have this kind of hub on our website that's called the Monitoring Toolbox. It includes our protocols, which um, is kind of relatively fresh off, off, the, off the presses, hot off the presses. I think um, we published this about a year ago and launched a new database and um, website and everything about a year ago. And so um, those have been uh, ground tested in the last 12 months. And um, I think it's been a success, which is really cool. And uh, alongside that, we're updating things that we're making like training videos that you'll be ha have access to in about a month. Um, and the data is readily workable. I'll show examples. Um, and we have newsletters and things like that that kind of keep folks connected to the to the project and and updated on again how the data are used and who who's doing what um, special projects and so forth. So check out uh, the monitoring toolbox and the shoreline survey guide. There'll be a link at the end um, if this is something that uh, interests you. So how will we use this information? One example I mentioned at the very beginning of the goals, we're interested in detecting changes in the amount and type of debris. And a really um, kind of locally relevant example was the tsunami that happened in 2011 as a result of the Tohoku earthquake in Japan. Um, so, so much um, material was released into the marine environment as a result of that event. And uh, on, the, on the West Coast, there wasn't a lot of baseline kind of Kind of there wasn't a sense of what was normally washing up on the shore um, and along most of the coast except for in, on the very outer coast in of Washington state, there was, there was a historic data set. And so after MD map was initiated, we were able, our, my colleagues were able to make a comparison to that historic data set and the MD map data set to uncover that there was a tenfold increase in debris loads um, for the items that that were, uh, so, so the amount of debris had increased about tenfold. Um, so that was something that I think folks that live along the coast and experience this saw that, um, but we've got numbers for it. And it was also um, an opportunity really to learn about the way that material moves in the ocean. And so all of the kind of lightweight stuff arrived first, things like foam, um, buoys, stuff that floats high in the water and had wind acting on it um, to increase its speed to get over here from Japan. And there were kind of subsequent waves 
of material that had different properties like that. Um, and so that was a really valuable learning um, opportunity uh, in addition to you know, obviously a, a, an enormous strategy. Um, but that was sort of um, one of the things that really hit home why there was a need for this baseline information so that we could measure change against it. And, and um, so we're getting that in Oregon now. And um, this story I think is one of the coolest examples of, of how the MDMAP data have been used. So looking at the effectiveness of a particular policy. And so the policy here that we're looking at is states that have container deposit legislation. So if you return a bottle, a plastic bottle or a metal can and you get 10 cents or five cents or whatever it may be in return, um, the idea is that should be an incentive for, for recycling and um, appropriately disposing of, of these materials. And what was found is that states that have that kind of legislation have about 40% less of that kind of debris on their shorelines. So that's pretty cool. Um, and this story uh, has been used uh, by states that and advocacy groups in states that don't have that kind of legislation to try to make the case for it. Um, and so we only, and um, the data here that we're showing is Alaska, California, Hawaii, Oregon, Virginia, and Washington, because at the time, those were the only states that had enough data in order to look at this question. Um, but our hope is that over time, um, we'll be able to tell the story across um, the whole US. And another cool example is um, where an organization that was collecting the data actually turned around and used it um, to inform change within their local community. So in this case, the Greater Farallones National Marine Sanctuary had been um, monitoring using MDMAP for several years and repeatedly was finding that one of the top items on their surveys were shotgun wads. So these are the plastic kind of casings that um, shotgun ammunition com comes in and then it gets released when a shotgun is fired. And they're used a lot um, for waterfowl hunting, which happens near shorelines and kind of upstream and estuaries. Um, and so they found, they, they noticed this, they documented the trend and applied for and received funding from the Marine Debris Program to develop a behavior change campaign um, that they, they actually co-developed it with the local um, waterfowl hunting community. And so they shared the data, shared the story of, of finding these items. Um, and that led to these new receptacles and messaging for picking up your wads basically. And what you get to do if um, in these hunting reserves is if you, if you put a wad in, you're, you're voting for your favorite duck. So are you team pintail or team mallard? And they're trying to kind of make it interactive um, and fun and then educational at the same time. Um, and I would love to see similar projects like this replicated all over the country where we identify a trend and a local source and then go about um, targeting it and reducing it. And so they're continuing monitoring in order to see the effect of this campaign. Another um, interesting example is um, just a change in local activities. So same group saw um, a lot of oyster farm related debris. Uh, there was a nearby oyster farm and they saw that the sites that they were monitoring that were closer to that oyster farm had more of that kind of debris. Interestingly, um, during the course of several years of monitoring and following um, kind of some heated legal battles, uh, the local oyster farm actually closed. And following the closure, there was a significant, statistically significant reduction in oyster farming related debris. Um, so just a, yeah, a story that activity matters and you can trace local sources um, to impact, to local impacts. So uh, I think there's probably more stories like this in the MDMAP data set waiting to be discovered. 
So those are just a, kind of a snapshot of different kinds of ways that the data have been used and, and will continue to be used. Um, I want to dive in now a little bit about if you're interested in getting involved, what's what does it mean to get involved? So Jesse shared what it looks like to establish a site. It's 100 meters long. Uh, most folks choose a place that they feel connected to that's important to them. Um, there's no right or wrong way to choose a site. Some people go to places that they know there's a lot of debris that they consistently see. Um, you can also choose randomly. Uh, we account for all of that in the data set. Um, each time you conduct a survey, you don't actually count and categorize debris in the entire 100 meters of it. We just sub do a subset um, for segments that are called transects that are five meters wide. And so that makes it go a lot faster. Um, and it's also more robust scientifically than if we were to do the whole thing. And again, we record the conditions. So things like, are there trash receptacles nearby? Um, how many visitors are on the beach? Things that could tell, uh, is there a, a freshwater outflow like a river or a storm drain that, that might lend itself to um, the patterns of debris that we're finding? Um, and then we, count, we survey for debris. So it's a, a little bit of a treasure hunt. Um, and we remove that stuff from the beach, enter the data, and then you can actually see the results right away. And I'll show you that in a second. And then we aim to repeat that monthly. Um, so that we can really detect, is there a seasonal pattern? Um, do we see more debris when there's a lot of tourism? Or do we see more when there's winter storms? Do we see different kinds of things at different times of the year? And what does that tell us about those sources? So that's why we do it repeatedly throughout the year. Over to you, Jesse. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Thank you, Hillary. Um, so here we have a couple of sites, one on the left again, this is the Neskowin site. And some of you who just finished these uh, survey trainings with me will, um, will, will, will recognize these photos um, and also what I'm talking about. And for those of you who are new, um, so on the left, you're seeing a volunteer with some flags and she's kind of pointing to a hill of trees. And if you close up into the photo, there are some other landmarks. So when we set, so the, the, the training really compose, is composed of myself, um, or you could do it yourself as well, but I am happy to come and help you actually set up your site, which is 100 meters um, along the beach. And then the site is from the back of the beach to the water. So that site, of course, will and Hillary can talk about this a little bit too. It's going to be a little. It's, it's going to vary a little bit depending on what the tide is. So you would you want to check the tides before you go out. Um, if you have a really really large beach, then it won't matter if you're there at a low tide. If you have a smaller beach, you're definitely wanting to get wanting to get there to save time and be there at low tide. And your flags, you won't be setting up your flags every time. So what you'll do, we'll set up the flags. We'll create our segment. And then while we're doing that, we look and you're like, oh, okay, here's the south boundary. And I'm looking and I see a staircase. And so that's where your south boundary is. So that when you come back, you have an idea about where your um, polygon is, your plot, your site. And on the right, this is a volunteer, um, a Coast Watch volunteer. And she's a volunteer for many other things as well. She's awesome. Her name is Kelly. And she was trained by Tara Dubois at Du Bois at um, Cape Perpetua. And she has decided to create her own site and she is going to do her site by herself. She's, so these are best done in groups, but Kelly is amazing. And so she's setting her up her site. I think it is, I think it's 184, but she's kind of in the Cape Perpetua area there. I think Ocean Beach is her area. And what she's doing here is we had gone to one end of the site and then we are counting out 100 meters with her wheel measure. You can see that her beach has a mixture of cobble um, 
And so, and then her back area there is like the mountain and we can talk, I'd like Hillary to talk a little bit about like in the winter time, if there is suddenly a lot of driftwood, you don't need to crawl and it's do not crawl through the driftwood. It's not safe to do so. Um, you don't even always want to reach in and dig through the driftwood to get your debris. And in fact, you don't want to dig to get your debris either. So um, just a couple of little pointers, but these are some re recent fresh shots from the trip that I wanted to share. Beautiful, this looks like such a great trip and I wish I could have come. Uh, I wish you could have been with me too. <laughs> maybe next, <laughs> maybe next time. time. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so you did ask, you had, you had one kind of particular question here um, around like, what if the beach ch profile changes and what that's yeah that back a, barrier yeah that back barrier so your back barrier you document kind of what you document the width of the beach each time you survey which can change of course with the tides um, but it can also change with what is possible on the back end so often there's a natural barrier like a cliff or dunes or something um, but those might, they can migrate throughout the year and you could have a big accumulation of driftwood that comes along after a storm. And that would mean that if that's the case, the, your back barrier is further towards the water than it was before. And that's fine. You tell us each time what the back barrier is. So it could be an accumulation of driftwood one month and it could be the dunes another month um, and your okay. beach one, yeah and your beach could be 20 meters today and 40 meters in the summer or you okay know. right so, and so this is one thing that I, I, I did not do during the survey trainings um, and for those of you who are here tonight I'm going to be sending a follow-up about this this but this is where the wheel will come in handy is you will need to measure that width um, when you do your survey. So that's from the water line to your back barrier. And you'll want to note exactly. that when, when you do it. So that was left out. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's great because what it allows us to do those measurements allow us to say, okay, per area of beach, how much stuff was found. Um, and of course, so we get essentially a density of, of items. So, um, it, it helps standardize for beaches that are really wide compared to beaches that are pretty narrow. Um, next up, I'm just going to give you a little diagram visual of, of what this looks like. So Jesse was describing, okay, you might have your south end over here and it's a, a landmark. That's what we would describe as the start of the site. And then all the way, it's 100 meters long across the length of the beach. Um, you measure that the first time you go out and then each time you survey, you just do these five meter increments that are transects that run perpendicular to the water. So from the water's edge to the back barrier, which would either be vegetation or a dune or dense driftwood, whatever kind of naturally breaks, uh, breaks up the, the beach, either physically stops you from continuing up or is um, essentially where the water really rarely goes, goes beyond. Um, and we, we really just look for stuff along the edge there and, and don't enter whatever that back barrier is. And Hillary, really quick, I just want to come in here for those of you. So this is a great diagram um, because it really shows you what we're looking for. So the back barrier can be, it can be a wall, it can be riprap, it can be dunal, it can be, for example, we have a new site, um, and the corner, so if you look at the, this, uh, the, the, the image that Hillary has up here and you look at the start and the back barrier, one of our newest sites, the corner of the, the what would it be? It would be the northeast corner of the Inn at Spanish Head is that start point, which is very cool. Um, I don't think I have a picture of that, but it's a uh, very interesting to, it's like a, it's a great uh, landmark so that's the starting point and then 100 meters up that beach which is taft in lincoln city so it's just an example of and then one other thing is that these five meter sections um 
these are random every time you head out and uh, you can email Hillary and she will send you the random transects for the rest of your natural life, if you would like. Um, yes, that's right. <laughs> or you, there's a formula that you can plug in yourself um, that you can have yourself. And so every time you go to the beach, these will be different. They might be the same because they're random, but you can see here in this example, it's 10 to 15, 20 to 25, 40 to 45, and 85 to 90. And so you're only collecting in these four transects. However, it's important to note that um, you, you should, and you might as well, because you're there and a lot of you do pick up trash, pick up outside of those transects as well, but you won't be counting those in, in the data. So that's exactly. an important point. And we, and we talk about that in the training on the beach. It's a lot easier when you're down there and, and talking about it. So anyway, Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. So you're, you only have to count and categorize and kind of get in the nitty gritty of the data with the stuff that you find in these, in these transacts, but that, that doesn't stop. I mean, we encourage cleaning up whenever, wherever, and, and people often make notes if they find something interesting or unusual outside of those transacts, because often that happens you the cool thing falls outside of your your right. random <laughs> that, and, and you can still take a picture of that stuff and let us know um yeah. but but the sort of the scientific approach is this randomization to get us a sample of what's what's happening um next up this gorgeous beach yeah, so this again is, I believe this is Ocean Beach, uh, Key Perpetua, and this is, um, this is Kelly standing at the end of her survey, looking toward the start of her survey, and this is actually a really good site. It's not a lot visited, and there was a lot of marine debris here. This day, we just simply did a training. We didn't pick up anything. Well, we picked up some things we didn't do. We didn't pick up any, any data. We just set her sight. And so this is her looking um, to the north. Um, I took this photo of her. And you can see, that, again, a mixture of driftwood and cobble. When you are out doing your survey, you just you want to be careful. I mean, I, I ideally, go out at low tide. Watch yourself. Do not pick up wood to look under, do not dig. You're just really looking um, what is available to you. So yeah, this was, it was a great day. This was, I had many, many trainings. I did not have to cancel one this morning, Kelly and I, which was incredible for Oregon in the winter. It was incredible. We didn't have one rain out. This was the one morning where we texted each other in the morning and thought, well, should we? And I'm like, no, nah, let's just meet and see what happens. And then this blue sky, uh, started appearing and it turned out to be a beautiful day. So you never know what the weather will be like. <laughs> you, you definitely don't. We always recommend dressing for all possibilities and, or at least bring the layers and yeah. um, being prepared. So uh, back at this, this, how do we tell anything about sort of the source of what we're finding on the beach? Um, how, what are, what information are we recording about each piece of debris that we find? Um, with the marine debris, with the NOAA's protocol, we, we count and categorize by a standard list of materials and item types. So it'll be like plastic balloon, plastic personal care products, plastic shotgun wallet wads. And so there's, um, they're all intended to uh, be comparable internationally, so to be meaningful and, and applicable around the world and informative about the item's general source and uses, but to also be succinct enough to be applied consistently. So it can't be a list of like 200 things. Um, and so there's this kind of standardized list that everybody uses. Um, but there is an option to add custom items that give more flexibility for, for local questions. So for example, um, here are um, some yellow rope snippets that are associated with the 
oyster industry in Washington in particular. It's the long line approach to seeding and growing um, oysters. And those don't show up you know, on the East Coast or in the Gulf of Mexico. They're really a, a West Coast, Pacific Northwest thing. And so a lot of organizations have chosen to track those here locally. I will say, I didn't mention this story, but it's pretty cool. Um, the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary was tracking these for about 10 years. And the data set um, and the observations that came from doing MDMAP surveys in that area really led to um, conversations with the oyster growing industry who have, and, and some funding through NOAA's Marine Debris Program to uh, recycle, uh, remove those items from, from um, the region, change the way that gear is, is used and actually recycle the, the, the ropes and turn them into crab carapace me measuring devices. So this is a cool project that's active right now, but they're upcycling the ropes um, and then preventing them from getting into the environment going forward. And, and that's um, in part because of MDMAP, but, and because of local organizations tracking this particular item that could be linked to that source. Another one is um, firework debris. A lot of folks choose to track that really specifically uh, because there can be big 4th of July events. Um, so that's an option if you want to track things more specifically than our general categories. Um, I can talk you through how to do that. If it might be something that somebody else is already tracking, that's super easy. If it's something new altogether, then we could add it um, as a subcategory. Nice photos here, Jesse. What's the story? So the one on the left is just an example of. Uh, of some beach trash or marine debris. So the reason why I put this here, Hillary, is because this pretty, this particular item, um, which would count because it's, it's larger than two and a half centimeters, but I don't think it was marine debris. I think it was beach debris. And there's a difference there. And so I had those questions when I was doing the trainings um, about what if it seems to not have come from the ocean? What if it doesn't have a battered look to it? Um, should we include that? So if I had found this in a transect, for example, um, and it's obviously larger than two and a half centimeters, would I include that? Yes, you would. Okay. Yeah, anything we don't, we can't really judge where, where, it, where something came from. Um, I, I think, and, and to, to be honest, some marine debris comes from beachgoers and just because it hasn't washed out into the ocean yet doesn't, it doesn't mean that it, it couldn't and that that's, a, that's one source of, of marine debris. So we're just happening to catch it on its way out and intervene before, before it gets there. But it's telling us something about, about our local source, our really, really local sources, um, if we find a lot. Um, on our beaches. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. So then that's why I brought that up. So if we find this, it might have come from the beach. Somebody might have just dropped it out of their pocket while walking on the beach hours before our survey. <laughs> um, we would include it. Yes. Okay, good. And then on the exactly, right, yeah. and then on the right is just a school group. Um, I did not take the picture on the right. Um, this is uh, in the Oregon Shores. Um, uh, Dropbox folder, but this is a uh, no marine debris survey group um, just taking kind of a, a stock of their items while they are on the beach. And you may, um, in, the, in the training that I did, um, we collected the items within the transects and um, we labeled our bags T1, T2, T3, and T4. And um, we just collected all of the items that were two and a half centimeters or larger into those transects bag, into those special transects bags, transect bags. And then everything outside, anything smaller than 2.5 centimeters or anything outside the transects we put into a separate bag. You can also use buckets, um, but it's great to have those things labeled before you come. 
Um, and then when you go home, you can, uh, and then, then you will uh, itemize them um, however you would like them. What I suggested to the volunteers was to put everything um, onto a, a piece of cardboard, a piece of paper, um, photograph it. Um, photographs are now not required, so, but there are places, uh, there is a, a, an area on the survey form um, on the NOAA site to add your photos. But what I didn't realize until I got back is that they are, no, they are not required now. Um, what is required is that you are checking how many cigarettes you had too. What is this a piece of plastic, a small piece of wood? Um, so if you're home and you know these items and you've gotten to know them and you take a photograph, great. It does, it is helpful. I talked to Hillary to have photos of these items um, because then they look at them to uh, compare whether you got it right, basically. So you can talk about that, Hillary. Yeah, totally. So uh, when a survey is uploaded um, to our database, which that's a good segue here. There's a couple options. <laughs> we, so there's paper data sheets, old school. You can collect the data on the beach using, using the paper data sheets and then go back home and, and enter it on your computer. Um, you can also enter it directly using your phone or a tablet if you have internet access. Um, it's, it's a website on your browser um, and it basically follows the exact same pattern is the data sheets when you go to enter it. Um, and I am a resource to help troubleshoot or ask questions as you get going. There's, you know, once you do it once, it's pretty smooth, but it can take, take a second to get used to. Um, but once you've uploaded your data to the database, it goes um, into a queue for folks at NOAA, like myself, to review. So we look at every survey and uh, double check that it looks like it adhered to the protocol so that it's all kind of a consistent and photos really help us um, identify like, is everybody calling a, a cigarette butt a cigarette butt? Is everybody calling um, a toothbrush a personal care product? And, and we can provide feedback or, um, or also answer questions um, if, you, if you have them and you provide photos. Um, so though, again, they're not required, but they are really helpful and um, we, we use them. So that's that story. And once you upload your data, you can actually look at the results right away. So one way to do that is um, this is an example of a site that has surveyed many months. So um, this is looking at trends over time. And the timeline, it, each line on the timeline and each dot corresponds to a month where a survey was conducted. And then um, the, the y-axis or kind of the, the numbers along the left-hand side are telling you how many items in the 100 meter site um, were found. And it's, these are averaged across the, the transects and then multiplied up to get to 100 meters. And so you, the light blue wash is telling you how variable it's the standard deviation. So there's an average and then how variable were the transects from each other? There might've been one that had one item and then another that had five. So the wash is gonna be wider than if every site had, every transect had just two items, if that makes sense. And so what you're looking at is a site that surveyed for, for several years, almost every month, the gaps you can see are where there is no blue dot and wash. Um, but this is all debris ever found on this site. You can also filter this by type. So you could look at um, item, just shotgun wads or just plastic bags and look at that for a single site or a selection of sites. So you could look at all of Oregon and plastic bags over time, or all of Oregon and its sites and shotgun wads, or all of Oregon and plastic, for example. And that lets us see, you know, is are the things that we're doing in a particular place or in a larger area making a difference? 
Um, I sure hope so. And that's the story we're hoping to be telling over time. Um, but you can look at this just at, at your site, um, which is right away after you've entered your data, the points get added to your timeline. Um, the other way to look is um, at composition. So what types of items are we seeing? What, what do we see on our surveys? Um, where the pie, the whole circle, represents the entirety of, of the items that we find, and then each kind of color chunk represents a different type. So the inner ring is material. Purple is plastic. No surprise there. Pink is processed lumber. In Oregon, interestingly, there's a lot more pro processed lumber type things like um, plywood and two by fours and stuff like that um, than we see in nearby states, Washington or California or Alaska. Um, and so you can look at composition by just your survey. So right after you enter your data, you can see, okay, what did we find? And, and, and look at it this way. You can look, what do we find overall at your site? Um, or again, a selection of sites. So in Oregon, what makes up most of what we see? And then you could compare your site to all of Oregon. Is it different from the rest of the state? Is what we see in Oregon different from Washington? I mentioned there's more processed lumber um, in, in Oregon than there is in other states. So um, these patterns are, are waiting to be discovered and then asked, like, what, what does that mean? Is it because industry is different here? Is it because ocean currents are different here? Is there something we can do about it? Um, but it's all right at your fingertips. So I think that is basically it. <laughs> um, there's a, a few different options for getting involved, and I'm going to let Jesse take that, um, and then I can chime in if there okay. are additional. Yeah. Cool. Um, yes, so there are ways to get involved, um, of course, locally in Oregon. Um, so right now there are three, well, until a couple of weeks ago, active sites in Oregon. Um, we're trying to increase that. Um, and so we should have many, many more. So you can contact Hillary. Um, Hillary is there to help you set up your account, your login and your password, and really any questions you have, like some of the ones that I was asking tonight, the particulars of the protocol, what you want to see, your, getting your uh, transects sent to you, um, what a random transect is, all of those kinds of things, because really Coast Watch is here to share the NOAA program with you. We are here to help you know about this program, and because we're here in Oregon uh, to actually get on the ground and help you set up the sites, which a lot of you are doing as a part of your mile. And so I get out there as much as I can. I do, we do have partners on the, along the coast now who I have trained and there are coast watchers who now can train you. So that's kind of what I'm hoping is going to happen is I train you and then I don't have to go from Astoria all the way down to South Beach or all the way down to Gold Beach, which I'd love to do. I do get down the coast a couple of times a year, two or three times a year, budget depending. We love meeting all of the coast watchers. I love meeting the volunteers and also spending time with our partners. So it is part of my job to get down there. But if you don't want to wait to set up a site characterization, um, you can talk to Hillary, you can talk to me. Uh, I can connect you with someone down there that can help you. Um, we could get on Zoom and we could talk about how to do it. Hillary is super responsive. Um, so she's on, on that end. Um, if you are a Coast Watcher and you want to know whether or not there's a site on your mile yet, or if you would like to know if maybe you don't want to set up your own site, maybe you want to be backup to another site. Um, a question that we got a lot uh, while I was out there was, uh, what about the winter months? And about those dangerous winter months, do we need to do them uh, in the winter? Don't do it if it's not safe. Um, yeah. Once yeah. a month uh, is what Noah wants. That helps with the science. Um, so, but if you can't, if you can't do it because it's not safe, then don't do it. Do it when you can. You also don't need to do it on the same day every month, but around that time would be okay. Um, other of you have asked that you travel sometimes for two or three months at a time. 
And that's great. Let, let me and Hillary know, and especially me, because then I can hook you up with a nearby coast watcher or someone who is there and wants to help do something for a couple of months and they can maybe fill in that slack for you. So let us know um, there are those that are cooperating in that way this time. So there are others that can help you if you only have, if you're a couple um, and you need more help during a survey, definitely contact me. You can also reach out to your, your local uh, county listserv um, and ask uh, others if they wanna help you, but I'm really good at uh, getting people together. So definitely reach out. Yeah, that's absolutely perfect. I will say I'm really eager to, to provide whatever support I, I, I can. And I'm, I'm all about Zoom or getting on, I have actually did a FaceTime uh, training with someone once. She, she called me from her beach and she showed me what was happening on her beach as she was setting it up, um, setting up her site. And in, in this kind of new era of technology, we're, we're making things work when we can't be everywhere all the time. Um, so uh, definitely reach out. And one thing that I've heard um, and seen a lot of folks do is if, if they're not sure if this is for them, but they want to help, um, but they want to kind of get a feel for what is involved, they'll see about helping somebody else at their site first, and they'll go out for a couple of surveys and then decide whether, mm -hmm. you know, do they want to continue to help out that way or do they want to establish their own site? Um, you know, there's a lot of different kind of levels of commitment that you can you can dabble with um, before before diving full in. Um, Thanks, Hillary. That's great. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So, are there any questions out in the universe? We're just really thankful for everyone that's here um, and your your time, and attention, and interest, and um, we're here to answer questions. Oh, I Don has a question. Yeah. Is there any way to incorporate microplastics into our debris surveys? Yeah. So that's a really good question. Um, some really small stuff that's like truly microplastics, things that are almost smaller than the naked eye or than, than what you can see with the naked eye are really require some sophisticated methods to do in a way that meets scientific standards and is usable. And so we, NOAA has not committed to asking people to do that and creating a, a method and supporting a method to do that because we're honestly skeptical that we can collect data that's gonna be useful. Um, um, and so we're focusing our efforts on macro debris stuff that we can see because it becomes smaller. It contributes to those microplastics. Um, that said, there are things that we find readily, easily all the time that are less than two and a half centimeters, but not super tiny. So like nurdles and above. So those little plastic pellets that wash, you know, everything that covers the strand line really frustratingly. Um, that many groups will tally independent of their two and a half centimeter stuff and put it in the comments. We may at some point um, adapt so that there's a module that allows people to opt in to, to doing debris of that size. I will mention that the COAST program, Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team, has a protocol that's specific to those size types. Um, and if folks are really keen on, on doing those things that are, what you do is you look inside of a quarter meter, um, a, a quadrat and you lay it on the ground and you really in a detailed way, look at, at what you find in a whole bunch of different spots along the beach that way. Um, and so that's an option, um, but, but NOAA has not committed to, um, to doing that yet. So that said though, maybe, because Hillary and I have talked about this before, about this question, John, and um, what I re would recommend is, even though it's not a scientific, it's, it's not a part of the protocol per se, I would include what you can 
I would take a picture of your site um, where the where there's a lot of plastic debris um, and like smaller than 2.5 centimeters. I would include that photo um, and I would make a note of that in your comments if you have that information. So I know it's not great to hear from know that they're, they're not committed to that yet, but they may. And there is a way, Hillary, I wanted to ask too, like can people who are not a part of this program and who don't have an account, can they look at other sites or can, yeah. can they look at these sites online? The public can just look at them to see what people are finding. Yes. So yeah, that's a, those, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I just want to make a distinction between microplastics, so the teeny tiny little things, and sort of what I would consider small debris, which is stuff that's just less than two and a half centimeters, but you can still see. So there okay. might be a future of that. Microplastics are a much trickier thing. And actually, it's it's much, I think that there's more future in monitoring for that using water rather than looking for uh, it. Interesting, the interesting. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a rabbit hole we can go down if we want. Uh, but your question was, can anybody look at what's there? And the answer is yes. Um, the database, anybody can explore the data. You can export the data into a spreadsheet and play with it if you want. You can, um, you can look into every survey. You can look at photos of any survey. That's all completely publicly available. Okay. Um, the only thing that's not is information about people and their accounts. So any any personally identifiable information is privately secured behind um, on, on, only the folks that know I can see that, but or the folks okay, that are cool. Okay. So if you're not a volunteer with the program and you don't have an account, but you're looking to see like what was found in a marine debris survey on Neskowin Beach, you can access that. You can see that. You absolutely can. And I would say we and, and people all over the world are constantly at accessing it and and researchers I mean I I find out I feel like once a month about a researcher somewhere that has used the data set to pulp, to ask a question and publish on it and we had we like didn't even know about it um, but somebody looked at it somebody used it recently to look at um, how like do wealthier areas have more or less debris than areas that are more socioeconomically depressed um, and, and publish on that and looking at the Gulf of Mexico and yeah so anyway there's just another example. That's very interesting and so yeah so that's why it is a good idea to put those extra photos in there and add your comments. Um, exactly yeah. You know, because it's still interesting to see, even if we're not officially, it's not in a transect per se. Um, you know, some of the sur survey uh, sections that we set up um, the last two weeks, some of these were pretty clean places, but others were not. And a lot of it, we, we couldn't pick it up. We couldn't pick up all of it, but you should, um, I, I would recommend and suggest just adding adding the photos taking a picture of that, you know, that strand or that drift line, that rack line of the debris um, anyway. So that yeah, with your scale ruler. So that's, that's what I do actually is I put my ruler in and then I take a picture of this. Yes, the line. ruler. Yes. Yeah. That's um, something else I wanted to provide that I forgot to bring on these surveys. So having a scale ruler, bring that with you is another good thing to bring on your survey. Yeah. And even if you don't have one, something that's like your pencil or Something that's a fixed length that just kind of gives a sense of scale is really helpful. Right. Somebody was using yeah, a photo. chopstick tube and something that I was watching. Oh, funny. Yeah. So are there any other questions? I don't think I've seen anything else. So we did have one come on uh, through Facebook and okay. it was Rob who asked, how often is instruction available? Instruction? Um, I, I think uh, probably the, the trainings. Is oh, okay. Asking. Yeah, well, um, he should reach out. So I just finished um, a number of them, but there are there were some who didn't actually fit into the, um, the schedule. So I am scheduling some more. Um, so if you're interested, I mean, these are things that could be done year round, but um, preferably when the weather is a little bit better. 
But that's funny because it's April and it just snowed. <laughs> so we never know. We sometimes have 60 degree days in January on the Oregon coast. So um, please, Rob, uh, contact myself or Hillary. We'd be happy to figure that out. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say, if you want, if you want it to be on the beach, you, you, it's got to work with Jesse's schedule. If you're happy to just kind of chat over the phone or over video, you can catch me anytime and we can work with your schedule. So um, yeah. both options are available to you. And like I said, too, um, there are other coast watchers who are getting to know how to set up a site. And so if they are willing, we could have volunteer to volunteer trainings as well. So. Jesse, the matchmaker. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, that's awesome. It sounds like uh, the program's really building and there's a lot of uh, great ways that you all just gave for folks to get involved and, and help in the effort. So thank you so much for joining us uh, for this library lecture. I really appreciate it. Great yeah. information. I know I'm going to have to go sift through websites now and learn so much more, um, but that was just wonderful. So thank you all. And thank you everyone for tuning in and joining us this evening. Uh, make sure to check us out next month for our last library lecture of the spring. And uh, we'll see you online. Thank you, Hannah, for having us. And thanks for everybody for showing. Nice to see you, Hillary. Same. Thank you all. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Hannah.